Hello, Internet. Good morning. My name's Pastor Gordon Nauman of Trinity Lutheran Church in Scarsdale, New York. You can look us up at trinityscarsdale.org. Today, we're having a devotion from the Portals of Prayer. You can get that from Concordia Publishing House's website. If you want to order that online to have that sent to you, cph.org. Come meditate with me. Hopefully today will be a little lighter. Um, I really do want to bring God's Word to you in a positive way, uh, which will always, of course, include law and gospel, but, but hopefully really focus on the gospel for you to bring you the good news that despite the, the anxiety around us and the angst, God is with us, uh, that we can, we can go through anything, really, um, and, and know that, that God's got our back, if not in this life, in the next. And that, that kind of overlaps then, right? That's the point. Okay. Uh, the reading is from Romans 5. It suggests 1 to 2 here, but, but really it's missing the point <laughs> if we don't go all the way through to verse 5. And uh, because I really want to address something in this context where I kind of briefly touched upon it in my last video, which kind of might have felt like out of place uh, when I said maybe God wants us to suffer. That sounds like a really weird thing to say unless uh, you really are uh, just surrounded by God's word and instant contexts of scripture like Romans 5 uh, come into your mind and in your heart uh, when you hear even words like suffering and you'll understand exactly what I mean in a minute. Romans 5, 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Come, Lord Jesus. More than that, to continue the context, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character hope and hope never puts us to shame in Christ Jesus. I'm kind of summarizing there, but that's pretty much word for word. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. He's not just some random concept, right? Some, some, some power out there or even in here. He's a person, the, the third person of the Trinity who is with us, as real as the second person of the Trinity, as real as God incarnate. Now, yes, if you want to think of himself uh, bodily as somewhat distanced from us as the, at, at the right hand of the throne, throne of God, but he really isn't that distant. He is the Word of God, right? So take Scripture as the living Word of God for you today, as Christ as the Father's Word, as, you know, the, when uh, there are many times in which the, the voice of the Father is heard, uh, at Jesus' baptism on the Mount Transfiguration, uh, other places, right, where he speaks and says, this is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased, listen to him, understanding just the, the real concept of the Father being there, being here, by virtue of his Son, who as Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And then, as Jesus says, I am in you and you are in me. And then, as the Holy Spirit, as we've heard about in our context, proceeds from the Father and the Son. God is here. He really is with us. Come meditate with me now our psalm from uh, Tone K. Uh, from the Lutheran service book, which I'm sure is older than that, but uh, that's where I'm referencing. Psalm 102, 1 to 17. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me, Answer me speedily in the day when I call, for my days pass away like smoke, 
and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and is withered. I forget to eat my bread because of my loud groaning. My bones cling to my flesh. I am like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I am likely a lonely sparrow on the house top. I changed the tone there. All the day my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink because of your indignation and anger. For you have taken me up and thrown me down. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come. For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. Nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. Right, what, a, what a fitting psalm again. And what a description of, of our own expressions of, of sorrow and, and confusion and, and anxiety. And, and what, do I, what do I dare risk? Because there is a balance. We, we are by nature animals of community. We, we can't be separated forever. We can't. <laughs> if the situation we're in deems that we need to necessarily be away forever, and get, get this, this is profound. And Jesus has instituted something by which we must necessarily come together, right? Covenantally. If Jesus can't fulfill his covenant and his promise, the end is near, <laughs> right? And, and this is a very scriptural idea, and I'm, I'm with our forefathers on this, our church fathers. And every, every good theologian and forefather believed this was the generation Jesus is going to come. And, and that's right, right? And this is my conviction too, though I'm probably a little wiser on this. Uh, it, 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 probably, uh, it probably isn't going to happen. But that's kind of my hope and, and our yearning. Lord Jesus, come. And by all means, I kind of really believe that this is it. He's going to come. Look around us. But in the meantime, we're going to do what we can. You, you know, as, as St. Paul expressed, look, of, of course I, I'd prefer to be with the Lord. But, but the Lord has a task for me here. And so I'm going to be here until what the Lord has for me to do is accomplished. And then I'll return to the Lord. I'll die. Whatever. Here's a, here's a fun analogy uh, for you. I'm Batman, right? Th th this is how I feel. I'm in this situation because cause I'm the one who, who really, sadly, I mean, the, the, the decision is upon me to, 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 to save who I can. Right, so there's the Joker, and he's got my my best friend Robin, my girlfriend Batwoman, and my my butler, all in different containers, and I've got to choose which one to save. He's going to drop all of them simultaneously into a vat of acid, and unless I choose one of them, I, I can't save anyone. But here's the thing. I'm not going to choose a lesser evil. I'm just going to go by instinct. So even to the point where, where jo the Joker is, is jeering me on and he's saying, choose, Batman, choose. Who are you going to save? I'm not actually 
making the decision to save one and kill the other, as soon as he says, okay, you're not making a decision, now I'm going to drop all three and they're all going to die, my instincts take over. And for whatever reason, I make a decision. I, I try to save one. I, I save the one I think I can save. And I, and I dive down. And I get a hold of one container somehow. But then, by the grace of God, may, maybe I can save them all. Maybe I can get out my... Whatever, what's, what's he called that? He shoots something out and he somehow gets that around his grappling hook. And he gets that around something and somehow he's able to swing around and, and save the others as well. By instinct. It wasn't, I made a decision to, to save this one and let the other die. It's, now that they're all falling to their deaths, I'm going to try and save someone. And then I'm going to try and save them all. And maybe I'll save them all. Maybe, maybe someone will perish. I don't, want to ch I don't want to close my churches. My churches. I only have one congregation. I don't want to, maybe you have a dual parish. I don't want to, to close my church, but th that was the instinct that I did this week. So that in the long term, I I'm hoping with my grappling hook to save them so that they, they remain healthy and that they have an opportunity to come back and receive God's means of grace again. This is a temporary thing, right? My instinct just last week, was not to close my church, even though this, is, this whole pandemic had already started. I said, I, I underestimated, I was ignorant. I was the ignorant one, and I said, come, come to church, receive the sacrament. We had about 17 in church, and we did that. I don't regret that. I gave people the healing gospel according to Christ's institution. There was just a greater risk, and, the, and there's a greater risk still if you watch any of those videos about how the disease is spreading, right now, now there's an even greater risk because it's out there and it's been out there for so many days and weeks and it'll be, soon be a month probably. It, it's out there. And unless we take greater precautions now that we're not ignorant and work as best as we can instinctively, that's all we, well, that's all we can do. <laughs> Just use your instincts, obey your conscience, do what you can, measure the risks, love God, love your neighbor, pray, pray. Um, we're, we're just in a new era. We're, we're, we're back to old school people. Don't, don't uh, drop by your neighbor's house. Pick up the phone by all means. Pick up the phone. See how your neighbors are doing. Say, how are you doing? Do you need anything? And And really, this is where... And, and we're measuring the risks here. I'm not calling the gathering of an assembly, but as the pastor, I should be on the front lines. If you need anything, I think the risk is worth it. If you are in a desperate strait, call me. I will serve you. I will come to you. I will give you what you need. Physically, literally. I think that's worth the risk. I am healthy in myself. Even though that is not, right, that is not the measurement by which we, we decide whether it's okay to be in, in interaction with people. The virus still spreads whether you're healthy or not. That's, that's the danger of this virus. That's why it spreads so quickly already. But that is a risk I am willing to take on a one-to-one -one basis with people so that I can serve desperate people. I mean, for goodness sake, people, if you've, if you're, really, if you're privileged, uh, which we kind of are in Westchester and New York, if you've stocked up, if you're on the internet and you can order food and it, and it be delivered, be sensible. Okay, don't, don't use me. Let, let people who are desperate, who are poor, who, who are in real risk of, of hungering and, 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 yeah, let them be the ones who utilize the people who are on the front lines, who utilize doctors and nurses who utilize pastors. Pastors, we should be on the front lines. I am not afraid to go to people's homes. If you want a home visitation, call me up. Send me a message. GordonNauman at gmail.com. Westchester, New York. I will visit you. B 
be sensible about this. There, there is still a risk here. I could catch something from you. You could catch something from me, even though I'm perfectly helpful, healthy. I have quarantined myself. There, there are no public gatherings here anymore. I'm, and I'm healthy. So I'm pretty sure it's, it's okay. Even if it's not, it's worth the risk if you are desperate. Okay, okay. Uh, I've, I've gone on too much about that. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Um, speaking of which, um, uh, this is our new community now. So, uh, so type a message, send me a message. Um, I'll maybe even reply. I'll, I'll answer so that everyone can benefit. I'll, I'll do another recording maybe tomorrow uh, during the devotion and I'll answer. If it's a really good question, I'll, I'll just bring it up and I'll, and I'll answer it in a video for you. Okay? This, this is our community now. Even better. Uh, give me a call. Let's see. Should I give you my mobile number? If you... If you really want to get in contact with me personally, send me a message. I am on Facebook. Send me a personal message. If you really want to talk to me, uh, hear my voice. You can hear my voice here. Um, I'll give you my number. Okay. I've done the Batman analogy. Suffering. Suffering is important. Um, we, we make way too much a deal about suffering today. Okay. Suffering is a reality. Suffering can be a good thing because it produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Those are two very different things, right? And, uh, here's, an, here's, here's a good analogy from an, an athletic point of view, right? If, if you want to, to be good um, uh, as an athletic runner and you, you increase your endurance by pushing yourself probably on a treadmill today, right? You, how, how, how long can you push yourself on the treadmill? You know, you start with 10 minutes, then 20 minutes, then half an hour. Uh, before you know it, you can run for hours at a time. And that's because there's kind of a pain threshold, right? You, you push through the pain sometimes. Well, it depends where you are, right? Um, don't push through the wrong kind of pain. Uh, if there's a pain somewhere and you're like, you just agitate it even more, you, you create a long-term problem. Don't do that, for goodness sake. Um, but, but as an athlete, you kind of train yourself to know what is just this kind of, the, this threshold by which if you, if you push yourself through it, you kind of get a second wind. Um, suffering can be a good thing. It can create endurance for you. It can increase your character. You, you can, uh, that, that means sense of humor. Uh, you, you can kind of laugh at things, right? Because <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of got through that. We're through that, that, uh, that hurdle. Um, and then, but the wonderful thing is St. Paul reveals this wonderful wisdom and insight and then it keeps going. This character uh, really expresses itself in hope as well. Hope, really, in, in who? And that, that talks about faith. Faith and hope in God. In the one who, who oversees everything. He's not unaware of our, of our sufferings and our struggles. He's with us. And he wants to struggle with us through our sufferings. Not that our sufferings will be avoided altogether. How can they be? But the heat, he, he struggles through the sufferings with us. And ultimately, when we think back to the gospel, how he has suffered for us on the cross, he's already gone through the struggle with us on, on an even higher level. Not just understanding what we're going through. He has complete and utter compassion for us because while we were sinners... That is, all of us, all the time, because we can't help but be sinners. We can't help but be weak. We can't help but be ungodly. He died for us. And of course, he rose from the dead. He justifies that. That was the first verse of our, our text, Romans 5. Since we have been justified by faith, this is all old news. <laughs> it's like we, we should be living as Christians now like for, a, for a long time now as mature Christians and don't despair in suffering, but as, as, as experienced athletes run the race, push through the pain, the good, the good sort of pain, and accomplish something. Let's get some, uh, some wise words from Portals of Prayer then. The theme is realign from Psalm 102.1. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. 
When famous people are vilified in the press, they often look for a way to be vindicated. Vindication would be proof that the charges are baseless, but vindication does not often fix the relationship damaged by the false accusation. The reputation that made them famous might be ruined. In this case, being justified is not enough. When we come to God in repentance, we have no hope for vindication, really, because the charges against us are true. Our relationship with God then has been ruined by our own doing. While we have no one to blame but ourselves, we do have someone who is standing up for us. Jesus steps in and earns our justification, our vindication. We're not proven right. We're not. We are instead declared righteous by God. Our relationship with him is realigned by virtue of what Jesus has done. Uh, has done. That's declared true. Amazingly. That, that's his grace right there. His full grace and pardon. As we deal with the sins we commit against one another, it is wise to remember then that repentance does not bring vindication Instead, it results in forgiveness. Those are two different things. Just because we forgive each other, which is a huge thing, right? I mean, forgive one another. How many times? Seven times? Seven? Seventy times? Seventy-seven times? As often as they're, they're actually repentant, they, they're, ge they're genuinely sorry. Forgive them. You, and yes, you know, there's a lot of confusion about this, whether we forgive and we forget. Uh, some people say, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget it, which they're really saying, I, I didn't really forgive you in the first place. But, but actually, that's true. <laughs> we do forgive and we don't forget because our behavior isn't vindicated by our forgiveness. It's vindicated by Christ. It's justified by Christ who still takes the, the right punishment for what we did even though we're forgiven by our neighbor. Our neighbor graciously and amazingly forgives us that, for, that, for that horrible thing we did because we asked for it. That doesn't mean it, it still isn't there, still doesn't hurt, isn't painful, doesn't cause us suffering. But repentance has been, been pleaded for, and the right thing to do is to forgive them, even though you'll never forget it, but, but really forgive them, but, but because know that, that Christ has taken the punishment for, for his sin against you and her sin against you. Christ has taken that punishment. So if they're, they're genuinely sorry for it, forgive them. Unlike a famous person, uh, we don't have to be concerned with our media reputation. It's more important for us to be grateful for the relationship we have with our loving God. Well, that's true. We, we should be as concerned with, with our relationship with our neighbor, but know that, that that flows from our relationship with God. There's no reason why we can't forgive our neighbor if he's genuinely sorry. And, and which, I mean, you just tell by his words, right? He actually confesses his sin to you and says, I, I shouldn't have done that. I, I'm sorry I did that. Please forgive me, right? Which, by the way, and we, we, we won't have time to get in this really in depth with this today, but, but if someone isn't sorry, you are not conscious, conscience bound to forgive them for something that they have not repented of, especially when they are not sorry for that. Those words of forgiveness don't need to come from your mouth. Jesus, the benefit of Jesus' salvation does not is not upon those who are not repentant for their sin. We don't believe in universal justification. People aren't saved if they reject the grace of God. It shouldn't be harder for you and me then. We don't forgive our neighbor willy-nilly. We don't forgive them everything. We aren't tolerant about everything. How can we be when it's wrong, when it's evil, when they're unrepentant? God doesn't forgive the sins of unrepentant people. If your neighbor is not repentant, you are not conscience bound to forgive them. 
But the Christian spirit is to always be ready to forgive. You are not a Christian if someone comes up to you and has, uh, and has wronged you and, and says, I am sorry, and you don't forgive them. Maybe they murdered your sibling or a member of your family. And they are genuinely repentant. You are not a Christian if you say, well, I can't forgive you for that. We must forgive if someone is repentant. Yeah, that was important. That was important. So I said it. Okay, let's end there with prayer. I am... I am so sorry. For, forgive me that I didn't, I'm being genuine now. I, I didn't pray in my last devotion. And that was a really important one to pray with uh, because like, it was a really serious one. Um, please pray with me. I'm going to pray now. And thank you so much. Someone sent me this prayer, a prayer that's been, uh, it's, it's been going around as a chain among um, pastors and, and their laymen uh, online. So I want to share this prayer with you. Thank you so much for sharing it with me. I'm going to share it with you. Let's pray. May our Lord's peace in the midst of uncertainty continue to flow in our hearts, souls, and minds as we meditate on Scripture with an open mind and soul as our Lord overflows His loving kindness, comfort, and strength in His only begotten Son, our Savior, on our behalf through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord's peace be with you. I pray that this, this message really is a strengthening one for you today. Be strengthened, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'll see you tomorrow.